And now part two of Jefferson Airplane. We last left off with Grace Slick joining the band, creating the classic Jefferson Airplane lineup. And her timing couldn't have been better because this was in mid-October when she joined, 1966. And in November, the band was going to go back into the studio and start work on their second album. RCA was not totally thrilled with the first album and the sales because it only sold regionally. And in, if it wasn't for some hype surrounding the San Francisco music scene in December, they may have ended the contract. But what started happening was this buzz around San Francisco and the music scene started happening and Newsweek even did an article on it. So that may have prompted RCA to think the timing was right. But taking no chances, they, they still had money to recoup. They brought in one of their staff producers named Rick Girard. And he very quickly recorded an album in only 13 days at a cost of $8,000. Needing a hit badly, they recorded the most commercial song they had. My Best Friend did chart. It bubbled under at number 103, so not that impressive. But this song was a little bit fruity, and it really wasn't indicative of their sound. And their sound by this time was starting to change and become harder. This growth we hear in their sound is really due to Yorma Kaukonen's guitar playing. He really turns up the volume on this album and it gets a lot more, I guess what we call this acidy tone. But what really shifted their trajectory was their next single. When the truth is found to be Somebody to Love was released simultaneously with Surrealistic Pillow, and both started to climb the charts with Somebody to Love getting all the way up to number five in the singles charts. So this was the hit the band and the label was looking for, and it made them one of the hottest bands on the scene. Now, a little bit different than Somebody to Love, which is a great rock song, Marty Ballon, who's known for his ballads, offered these two beauties. Paul Cantor met those ballads with two slices of breezy psychedelia. DCBA 25 is one of my favorite songs on this album, and it's punctuated with Grace Slick's nice backing vocals and Yorma's chiming guitar solo. Now, Yorma offers something completely different than anything else on this album with an acoustic showpiece called Embryonic Journey. Hoping Lightning Would Strike Twice, RCA released a second single with Grace Slick as lead vocalist. And this was an odd choice for a single with its slow groove and its obvious drug references. Go ask Alice when she's ten feet tall. This tale of Alice in Wonderland meets Ravel's Bolero started burning up the charts and it made, made it all the way up to number eight. So they had a second smash hit single on their hands. And uh, having another hit garnered opportunities for them outside of California, longer tours to the East Coast, and television appearances. And this made Grace Slick somewhat of a star within the band. Now these were the only two songs she brought over from the Great Society, and I think they wanted to integrate her to the band a little more, which is why they allowed her to do some of her songs. Little did they know that these would be the big hits. So one of the things White Rabbit and Surrealistic Pillow did for the music industry is this, this was more music for adults. I mean, you can hear it in just about every song. And this supported what the, the new FM radio format. Bands like The Doors, Jimi Hendrix Experience, these were new bands at the time coming out, starting to chart high and sell a lot of records. The Beatles obviously were going in that direction as well. So Surrealistic Pillow really was the dawn of a new age. Just a couple things here. I, I remember buying this album. You can see this has got the Best Buy series stamp on it. I bought this in the mid 80s and you can still buy budget albums then. So this is my original. Uh, not an original from uh, 67, of course, but um, it'll suit me just fine. Now, the photograph on here is very famous. This is a Herb Green photograph, and he did a lot of the, the San Francisco bands during this time. 
and this is one of the iconic photos that he's done. When they recorded this album, they were firing on all cylinders, and they left a couple extra songs in the can that didn't make it onto this album, and one of those was this song. Got a feeling coming from inside Now, JPP Mixed Up B Blues was a Skip Spence song, and since he wasn't in the band anymore, maybe that's why they didn't, they didn't add it to the album. Uh, but it's a great little slice of folk rock, and uh, just goes to show you how much good material they had. Now, that song can also be found on the early flight compilation that I mentioned earlier. Now, one other thing about this album that you may notice if you read the liner notes, it says uh, Spiritual Advisor Jerry Garcia. So Jerry Garcia was invited down to Los Angeles to help, I, I don't know why they asked him, because he would be the least likely guy to help arrange something that's commercial, but he did. There's some confusion as to how much input he had on this record. Basically, the producer, Rick Gerard, says that he never met Jerry Garcia, he's never seen him, and he didn't play on the album. But I think what happened is the band recorded this over 13 days, and they were there after hours in the studio. And the way I know this is because Marty Ballin had talked about the song Coming Back to Me, that he had smoked this big joint in the afternoon and wrote this song immediately, went back down to the studio, and they recorded it. So Jerry Garcia was there and does play on that song on, and on a couple other songs. So I think some of these songs were recorded after hours when Gerard was not there. So Garcia plays on JPP Mixtepe Blues and three other songs. And instead of giving him credit on the album for guitar playing, he was listed as spiritual advisor. With their newfound fame came some other opportunities. They did a series of ads for Levi's. In the last segment, I had mentioned that Bill Thompson had been named manager when they fired uh, Matthew Cates. And I think everybody knew this was temporary because they did find somebody uh, bigger and better, I guess you could say, and that was Bill Graham. Now, Bill Graham had just got permits and secured the Fillmore so he could do concerts there regularly. And I don't know that he'd be a better manager necessarily because he really had no experience. But what he did have was the venue. So the, the airplane would have constant work there and they'd always be paid top dollar to play those venues. And there'd be an extra cut taken by Graham. Now, Bill Thompson took this all in stride and essentially moved back into an assistant manager position. He was always very supportive of the band and uh, that's why he was so valuable to them. With all this happening, uh, 1967 was really shaping up into this summer of love. And as I said earlier, there was this hype around San Francisco, the love generation, the hippies. The hippies were seen as somewhat of a, a novelty. And they had these bus tours you've probably seen and going through these hippie neighborhoods in the Haight-Ashbury district in San Francisco, where a lot of the people, well, the hippies congregated. This began to be news for some reason. By June of 1967, the hype regarding the hippie culture really started to take off. And this coincided with some of the outdoor music festivals going on. Um, the Monterey Pop Festival was the first of its kind, and this was going to be happening in June. The Beatles' Sgt. Pepper had just been released, so that's filling the air. And um, there was a music festival called the Fantasy Fair and Magic Mountain Music Festival at Mount Tamalpais in Marin County. And that happened a week or so before Monterey. So this started going on, and it always seemed to be sunny when I look back at pictures of 1967 in the summer. And Jefferson Airplane had a great set at Monterey. I had mentioned earlier that Grace Slick became the focal point of the van, band visually. This is very evident at the Monterey Pop Festival and the film that came out afterwards called Monterey Pop. In the Jefferson Airplane set, the camera focused on her, even when Marty Ballin was singing. I think they actually thought she was singing, but she wasn't. And uh, she got so much attention that she was listed separately in the credits.
With the runaway success of Surrealistic Pillow, the band was giving free reign to do their next album and complete creative control. And for this, they were given another producer, it was Al Schmidt. And he took a very hands-off approach and essentially was kind of an anti-producer, which is what the band wanted. They wanted the freedom to not compromise and to get louder, to stretch out, and to really push the boundaries, which they did on this record. Now, the most noticeable change is the intensity in Kalkinen's playing. He used a lot more feedback, and they were trying to replicate some other stage show on album. This Cantor song let off the album and steered the band into uncharted psychedelic territory. And this was released as a single, believe it or not. And it has this avant-garde feel to it. It's very harsh. There's all this feedback. Not likely to be a hit single, and it stalled at 42. So that's not that bad of a charting, but it had a lot of a momentum because the band was doing so well at the time. So the lengthiness of it kept it uh, from doing well in the pop charts, but it did pretty well in the FM dial. on the holy dregs and they're constant getting throw up on his leg Molly's gone to blaze Now the overall atmosphere of this album here it is right here it is much darker and much harsher and on the Two Gray Slick song she steers uh, the listener into this kind of Middle Eastern flavor with Rejoice and on the Sinister Two Heads The song most like any work on the previous album is the song Martha, which is a brilliant fusion of folk rock and their new sound. She does as she pleases, she waits there for me. Unfortunately, having carte blanche in the studio yielded some self-indulgent pieces like Spare Change and the, the Pathetic. A small package of value will come to you shortly, which was a kind of a sound collage by Spencer Dryden. It seemed only to be a vehicle to give him a writing credit for the album. So here's the album, After Bathing at Baxter's, and the strange title is a euphemism for after taking acid. That's what that means. So they always had these little drug references in here, and there was a lot of acid ingested while making this album. And it, it led to a polarizing listen for most fans. Some were expecting more of a surrealistic pillow. Others really liked this album. And it's not commercial, uh, completely undanceable. And um, it didn't do too well. It, it's, it cost them $80,000 to make, and they did it over five months, as opposed to the $8,000 album Surrealistic Pillow was that only took 13 days. So this was noticed by the record company and things were going to change on the next album. Critic John Swenson summed up the album as an attempt to capture the psychedelic aura of the airplane's live performances on record. The density of the album's production was truly staggering, but it was an attempt doomed to ultimate, if even heroic, failure. You can't record an LSD trip, so the album ends up sounding like a bizarre indulgence. So I kind of agree with that. I mean, I know a lot of people really like this album, but I find it self-indulgent. I find it a little bit hard to listen in places, although it has some great highlights. Now, the high sales of Surrealistic Pillow made for a huge advance order for this album. So it did chart high at number 17, but then sales fell off quickly after that. Along with fame and fortune came problems with the band. Uh, the first one was Marty Ballin's meager contributions to this album. He only had one writing credit, and he had a hard time getting band members to help him on his songs. So there were two other songs that they recorded at this time of his that were left off the album entirely. But this is brightness so dazzling my head must turn You know my head must turn So factions started to form within the group, the first one being 
Jack Cassidy and Yorma Kalkinen, they wanted to get heavier and get a heavier sound live, and Marty Ballin's songs didn't really fit their vision. Grace Slick, she sang on the two hit songs, so she became basically the leader of the band, or the most focal point of the band from the public's perspective. And this kind of pissed off Marty because it was his band. And like I mentioned earlier, the Monterey Pop Festival really highlighted her and, and even gave her her own billing, Grace Slick with Jefferson Airplane. As the founder of the band, these were tough pills for Marty Ballin to swallow. By early 1968, egos began to get out of control. And one thing the band didn't know was that Grace Slick was in negotiations with Electra Records for a solo deal. And this was more than just a couple meetings, so she was serious about it. Inside the band, there was an issue with Grace Slick because she formed a romantic relationship with Spencer Dryden, the drummer. And they used their clout to steer the band. A prime example of them throwing their weight around had to do with the firing of Bill Graham. He got fired in early 68. Part of the reason was, is he was working them too hard. I mean, he, he had these venues where he could fill, and they were playing live a lot. So they were garnering good live money. But this took its toll on the band members, particularly Dryden and Slick. And Grace Slick's voice wasn't quite ready for that. So they said, either he goes or we go. So they fired Bill Graham. Now, Slick was unable to consummate a deal with Electra, so she stayed with the band. And Bill Thompson, good old reliable Bill Thompson, was reinstated as manager. Now, all that heavy touring they were doing caused nodes to form on Grace Slick's vocal cords. So they had to take a break for, from some live shows for a while. And, uh, but during that time period, Bill Thompson started to really stabilize the band. And one of the things he did was he purchased uh, one of the mansions in San Francisco right off Golden Gate Park, 2400 Fulton Street. And this was a, a place where the band could practice, uh, kind of like living quarters, they could do rehearsal there, and there were offices there. So that was a place of stability for the band, and Bill Thompson was a really steadying force. Once Grace Slick was back in shape to sing, they began work on their fourth album, Crown of Creation. Now, Crown of Creation was a little bit of a return to a slightly more commercial sound. They the songs were a little bit more concise and less freeform, which resembled Surreal Pill a little bit more, but they still kept their hard experimental edge. Creamy suntan, color that fades when she fades. Greasy Heart was the first single from the album, and it charted at a dismal number 98. But the fact of the matter is, is that Jefferson Airplane, they weren't interested in singles at this point. They were an album band, and album-oriented rock was ruling the day, and that was really their focus. Jack Cassidy's bass cuts through on nearly every track, and Yoma Kalkinen's guitar playing is a little more refined in this album, especially on the Cantner Ballon song, In Time, where we find him underplaying to remarkable effect. Grace Slick's approach to performance was really ruffling the feathers of the establishment. Now this was one instance where she obviously ruffled some feathers, and it was just her way. She wanted to make the audience uncomfortable. That's just part of her deal. That's what she did. And she not only showed up in blackface here, but she once dressed up as Hitler, dressed up as a nun, and would at times would even taunt the audiences. Eyes alive, your mind still growing, saying to me, what can we do now that we both love you? You and me, we keep walking around and we see all the bullshit around us. In keeping with risque topics, they covered the unreleased bird song Triad, which the topic of that song was of a menage a trois. And the apocalyptic House of Puniel Corners ends the album on an explosive note. Let's have a look at the album here. So 
we got another Best Buy series here. So this is a photo that superimposed over the bomb, the nuclear bomb at Hiroshima. So that's, uh, there's still very much explosive on record, but I would say this, is, this album has a much less avant-garde feel than the predecessor. Now, despite a couple of clunkers on here, this album did very well and returned them to the top 10, and this was their second highest charting album at number six. And one interesting song that didn't make it on here was a collaboration by Frank Zappa and Grace Slick. Now, comparing these two albums, um, this Crown of Creation, I, I like it better, but it feels like a step sideways from Baxter's, which clearly was a step in a new direction. And I think the band had a little bit of trouble deciding which direction to go. They're trying to play to both crowds, and they do a pretty good job on this album overall. And I would say that Jorma Kalkinen and Jack Cassidy's playing even got heavier. But one thing that got a little bit lighter was Grace Slick's vocals. They sounded more like a little girl. Not sure if that had to do with some of the node surgery she had, but that was just the style that she used on this album. By the summer of 1968, when this album was released, the counterculture started getting more jaded and more restless. With the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy, you had the escalation of the Vietnam War. Such was the climate, and the band kind of reflected the times in their music. One of the th things they also started doing, these big concerts started appearing and they played their biggest show to 100,000 people at the Newport Pop Festival in Costa Mesa, California. And they started to draw big crowds abroad. Heavy tour schedules and studio work couldn't hide the problems that had started earlier in the year. Band members started to use heavier drugs and slick and dry and became more and more difficult, mostly because of their abuse of alcohol. Now viewed as counterculture spokespersons, the Jefferson Airplane was, was sought out by filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard for a film he was working on. He wanted to shoot the band on top of a building playing live. And this happened at New York Shuler Hotel for an early morning concert. This was in November 1968. Now this didn't last long after two songs they were shut down because it was so loud. <laughs> This must look familiar to people of anybody that sees this film. The Beatles did this exact same thing two months later for the Get Back, Let It Be project. And I get asked the question, well, did the Beatles know about this? Did they get the idea from Jefferson Airplane? And my, my answer is probably not, because first of all, the Godard film never was released at that time. And maybe talk of that concert uh, made the trade papers, but having listened to 90 plus hours of the Get Back, Let It Be sessions of the Beatles, they bring up all kinds of different bands. They mention them, but Jefferson Airplane is never mentioned. So my guess is that it just was two bands that had the same idea. The Beatles, in their case, it was a last resort to shoot them live. And in, in Airplane's case, it was Jean-Luc Godard's first choice. So you decide. From December 1968 through March 1969, the band went on a hiatus while Grace Slick recovered from her throat surgery. Jack Cassidy, on the other hand, not able to sit still, made do by playing bass with Country Joe and the Fish in the downtime. He also formed a duo with Jorma Kalkinen, an acoustic duo called Hot Tuna, and they started to play live apart from the airplane while the airplane was in this hiatus period. One thing they did release, finally, get these albums out of the way, they released a live album of their own. This is Blessed's Pointed Little Head. This is Jack Cassidy on the cover here after a long night, apparently. They're at their peak as a live unit when they recorded this. And one of the things that I think you'll find is that it, it captures more of that acid trip that they wanted to capture with after bathing at Baxter's but were unable to do. I think they come close to it with this live album. Grace Slick branched out and recorded a series of short musical pieces for a new show. There was a children's show called Sesame Street. Seven. 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 One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
After four months, the band decided that they were ready to get back in the studio, and this is the album they started working on. And we're gonna cover this in part three here on Pop Goes the 60s. One for Paul, one for 